<laughs> hello, welcome, welcome. Now, do gather round, gather round now. I'm so happy you've arrived safe and well. I am Juliet Gordon Lowe, but my friends and family call me by my nickname, Daisy, so I hope you will too. Now, I'd love to know your name and where you are visiting from. Do let us know. Well, it's a beautiful day here outside my home in Savannah, Georgia, and I'm so looking forward to celebrating the anniversary of Girl Scouts with you all. As the year is 1922, this month marks our 10th anniversary, and what an incredible journey it has been. You know, it wasn't until I was in my, well, my 50s that I started the Girl Scouts. So you might well wonder what my life was like before I took up scouting. Well, it, it all started here in Savannah. I was born on October 31st, 1860. That's right, Halloween night. <laughs> I was the second daughter for my parents, William and Nellie Gordon. My father, you see, he worked in the cotton industry and my mother, well, she hailed from the family who founded the city of Chicago. Now, both of them were very loving and intelligent and adoring parents. Uh, my father's side of the family had many uh, military men, and including those who served in the Revolutionary War. So he instilled to me those values of good citizenship and, and duty. He was a, a quiet, serious man, but doting and so kind. Now, had Girl Scouting been around when my mother was a child, she would have been a model scout. She grew up on the frontier of Illinois, where she learned how to grow and cook her own food, uh, sew her own clothes, make her own shoes, nurse the sick back to health, and all the wisdom that her pioneer mother and grandmother father and grandfather passed down to her. My mother was also a gifted writer, artist, musician, while she even spoke and swore in six different languages. A remarkable woman indeed. Now, some of my earliest memories, well, my father was not present. I had only known my father by my mother relaying his letters and speaking fondly of him while he was away. I also saw my mother worry, sometimes tearfully, for my father. Uh, you see, he was fighting in a war, what I would later understand to be the Civil War. Now, I was just a toddler during this war, and couldn't possibly understand all its complexities. But what I could understand was simple acts of kindness that my mother showed to our neighbors in need during this time. You see, during the war, Savannah was blocked off from receiving resources such as uh, food, <laughs> clothing, and other necessities. So it was very difficult to uh, procure certain items. Well, I saw my mother help our neighbors as best she might and provide any extra food and supplies we might have. And there were even a few neighbors that lived with us for a while, including an, an Italian family and a Jewish family as well. But some of our neighbors did not want to receive her help. <laughs> my mother was from the North, a Yankee, and had many family connections to the Union Army. So some of our neighbors treated her very poorly. But my mother was also very well connected, you see. Uh, I remember my mother's family friend, General Tecumseh Sherman of the Union Army. Uh, near the end of the war, he visited us at our home in Savannah. I must have been about four years old. And of course, I didn't understand a thing about the war during that time. All I wanted to do was be my daddy's good little rebel, as he called me. 
Well, I'll tell you a story that I don't remember myself, but my mother told me this. I went up to General Sherman of the Union Army and I began to inspect his head. <laughs> well, what are you doing, little girl? He said, I said, I'm looking for your horns. My horns? Well, you are that old devil Sherman, aren't you? <laughs> Now that could have been quite an embarrassment, but luckily General Sherman had quite a sense of humor. I must have overheard some of my daddies talking <laughs> to hear that he was an old devil. Now, fortunately, those difficult war years would pass and my father returned home safely. I enjoyed a very happy childhood, uh, though I did suffer from chronic illnesses, earaches in particular, which resulted in some of my hearing loss, but I do have many sweet memories of playing with my sisters and brothers and cousins. Uh, we would all write and perform our own little plays for the family, and of course I was always the star. <laughs> we'd even vacation together in the mountains of northeast Georgia, and we'd even do good deeds together such as the time we made a club, and we called this club the Helpful Hands Club. <laughs> now, one of our projects was to learn how to sew clothing because there was a poor family that we knew, and we just couldn't stand to see the children, my own age at the time, running about practically in rags. Now, the clothes we made for them, they weren't the most fashionable. In fact, our parents started calling us the Helpless Hands Club. <laughs> but I just knew, even then, that I had to do something. And that feeling has been with me all my life, to be of some use to this world. Uh, now, as I grew older, well, I attended boarding schools. That's a place where you are educated and you live there. Now, <laughs> I wonder how many of you would like to live at your school? <laughs> well, I did have a wonderful time at the various boarding schools. Uh, one was in Virginia, another was in New York, at least from far away from home. Now, I, I studied uh, history, uh, literature, the French language, mathematics, uh, oh, and art. Hmm. Now, spelling was not my strong suit, <laughs> but certainly what I was best at was talking. I was a rather sociable girl, and I did make friends with ease. My two best friends were, and still are, Mary and Abby. They shared my love of animals, and oh, I recall one time, oh, we came across an, an unfortunate little sparrow dead upon the ground, and we decided that this poor creature deserved a proper funeral. So we decorated a little box to bury it in, and I even gave a somber eulogy expressing thanks for the little bird for its song and beauty. Now, as I grew older and I began to approach a marriageable age, and well, I fell in love. I fell in love with an Englishman named William Lowe. I called him Willie. Now, he was the son of a very wealthy and prominent businessman named Andrew Lowe. His father had expected his son to marry well, perhaps even to royalty. And while my family lived a, a comfortable life, we were not nearly as wealthy as Mr. Andrew Lowe. Now eventually, despite the opposition from both of our parents, we married. And on my wedding day was when my life changed in a completely unexpected way. At this time in my life, I had one pretty good ear for hearing. And just a year before I got married, I had tried an experimental treatment for my bad ear using uh, some substance called a silver nitrate. 
Now, this experimental treatment further damaged my ear and led to some hearing loss. Now back to my wedding. As Willie and I were leaving the chapel, it's a tradition for our guests to throw celebration rice into the air. Now can you believe that one little grain of rice fell into my good ear? And the surgery to remove it, it caused permanent hearing loss and much pain. Why it took weeks to recover and it was quite lonesome for me at that time. You see, Willie and I, we were living in Scotland and England, depending on the season. And I was so far away from home and very lonely. I say we were both living at home, but it often felt as if Willie lived at the horse races or the hunting woods. As if I wasn't saddened enough by all this, I also learned that it was very unlikely that I would ever have children of my own due to yet another medical condition. So there I was, a newlywed, yet lonesome and sickly, and still a, a very wealthy young woman whose path had been completely altered by things which were out of my control. All my life, I had been expected to be a good wife and a good mother eventually. Yet that little grain of rice, <laughs> it made it very difficult to communicate with my own husband. And I'd expected to be a loving mother and fulfill that sacred womanly duty expected of all women in my time. And yet that was also taken from me as well. I felt as though I had failed somehow. I could not understand why. I deserved such heartbreak, but don't we all, when things get hard, we just can't see past the fog of our own pity and pain, and it can convince us that there's no way out of it. But even then, I was the same Daisy I always was. I couldn't stand to sit around and be useless. I still had my legs to carry me, uh, my arms to lend a helping hand, and a voice to make myself known and heard. So I stopped my moping about, and <laughs> I acquainted myself with my new home. Now, my home was called Wellsburn House, and that was our estate. And I met lovely people from the nearby village and even began volunteering with some of the working girls there. I recall I, I also met a poor woman who suffered from leprosy, a, a terrible disease of the skin, and I visited with her nearly every week. Such a dear. I met the wife of the local vicar who has a fantastic uh, woodworking shop, and she was quite rare for her uh, trade. A woman as a woodworker, you see. And she even taught me a few woodworking skills as well. Well, as I was meandering about the town, getting to know the locals, I eventually even met the blacksmith who agreed to show me his trade too. I designed and even helped forge our own iron gates for Wellsburn House. <laughs> These were the people who made me feel like myself again. Of course, uh, Willie and I did have many social gatherings at Wellsburn House with the most prominent and elite of guests. And I did enjoy hosting and providing a good time for our guests, <laughs> even convincing some of them to join me in my spur of the moment fun. <laughs> Though sometimes my hearing loss led to some uh, incidents. <laughs> One time I decided to rally some of the guests for night fishing. And as I cast my reel, well, it wasn't long before I had a catch. And I was so excited, I called for them to bring the net, bring the net. But it was no fish that I had caught, oh no. I had hooked the ear of one of my own guests and I could not hear his cries for help. Now, fortunately, he kept his ear just fine, though. I'm not sure if he's going to attend my parties anymore. <laughs> now, 
Having many connections, especially to the British military through my husband, I did travel quite a bit. Among my favorite destinations was Egypt. I found the ancient pyramids splendid and awe-inspiring. What's more is that in the Egyptian climate, my hearing loss almost disappeared. I was just amazed, though keeping myself busy with travel and planning parties, helping among the village. It was not until um, 1898, when I was about 38 years old, oh, I was truly put to the test. The Spanish-American War had begun, in part to overthrow Spain's rule over Cuba. Now, nearly all of my family was serving in some capacity, and I, too, wanted to do my duty. My mother and I, we went to a place called Camp Miami in Florida to nurse soldiers. Now, Camp Miami was the complete opposite of my life at Wellsburn House. It was terribly hot and humid with mosquitoes everywhere swarming about. We had to make a makeshift hospital there that could accommodate 5,000 soldiers, yet we had to pack in 7,000 into that space. We never had enough supplies, so my mother used her connections to provide supplies like mosquito netting, uh, ice in an ice box, uh, fans to keep the soldiers cool, and milk as the water had to be boiled to disinfect it. Now, we soon had to increase our capacity and create an entirely new facility in a local church. The need was so great that my mother was called to lead another hospital and I was to manage Camp Miami's, which somehow I did. And it was the hardest work I've ever done. And it was the most alive I had ever felt. Now, when the war ended and I went back to my comfortable life at Wellsburn House. I was a changed woman. I still enjoyed our social soirees and the luxuries of our life, of course, but helping those soldiers and learning so much so quickly, it was as though I had discovered something that was missing all along. That fog I told you about, well, it lifted just enough for me to see a new path before myself. But where it should lead, I still had no idea. Now it was around 1910 when I met Sir Robert Baden Powell, a military man and a war hero from the Boer War, who had begun a fine organization called, oh, did you guess it already? Boy Scouts. Now, we took an immediate liking to one another, and soon he revealed to me that nearly 6,000 girls had tried to register for Boy Scouts. <laughs> some of them used their own initials, or some of them used their brother's names. <laughs> so BP, uh, my nickname for Sir Pow, told me that his sister Agnes had started an organization for girls called Girl Guides, which taught many useful skills for young girls. Now, I was intrigued and, well, I should say I was enthralled. All my life I had been fascinated by so many different things that I felt I never could choose just one skill to master. And here was an organization where youngsters could learn skills in so many different useful and fun activities. I soon became a girl guide leader for troops in Scotland and England, learning along with the girls. <laughs> but this was my path. I just knew it. And after just a, a year or so, I was determined to bring this organization to the United States. I went back to Savannah and I phoned my friend and cousin, Nina Pape. Now, she's a well-known educator of young women in Savannah. And I told her, Nina, I've got something for the girls of Savannah and all America and all the world, and we are going to start it tonight. And so in March of 1912, 
I formed two American Girl Guide patrols with 18 girls. <laughs> Luckily, all those years of socializing and making friends with the famous helped me spread the word quickly. Now, as our numbers grew, I released an American Girl Guide manual titled How Girls Can Help Their Country. I established our headquarters right here at my home in Savannah. We drilled and marched in my own yard. <laughs> Now, there was some controversy, however, by the so-called boyish activities in which Girl Guides participated. Well, we did just about everything the Boy Scouts did, which had me and my girls thinking about our name. Since we were doing just about everything a Boy Scout does, it soon made sense to me and my girls that we ought to be called Girl Scouts. So, in my usual fashion, I did what I set my mind to do, and in 1913, we had Girl Scouts and even a national headquarters in Washington, D.C. By that time, it felt like Girl Scouts was unstoppable. I was constantly writing letters, meeting with anyone I could, and recruiting women and girls all over the country. And as I stand here today in 1922, we have over 80,000 registered Girl Scouts. And I can't help but believe that number will continue to grow. You know, I had so feared a life without children of my own, but now I have thousands of intelligent, strong, truly remarkable daughters in the Girl Scouts. And as every mother has experienced, there have been difficult lessons as my child has grown up faster than I could have ever imagined. I wanted so badly to keep Girl Scouts in my control, in my protection. But as one brave council member, Helen Starrow, wrote to me, I remember her words exactly. She said, your child is grown up and has a will of its own. You want to see it choose the right associates, but you must be careful not to try personal control it has outgrown. Well, this was a difficult letter to receive. The truth is sometimes difficult, isn't it? But it was this letter that taught me a lesson that I had yet to learn. <laughs> My whole life, I had yearned to help others in any way I could, but I did not allow others to help me, not in this way. You know, I, I always joke that being hard of hearing means that I never have to hear the word no. <laughs> but this letter, it taught me to truly listen. And now that I have I've stepped down from the presidency and transitioned to founder, I am so proud of how much Girl Scouts has grown on its own. Like any mother, I still have a watchful eye and a guiding role, but my girls, they're independent. In fact, they're thinking of ways to sustain Girl Scouts that I never would have considered. Uh, for instance, um, one Girl Scout troop in Muskogee, Oklahoma, I believe it is, uh, why well, they recently had a very successful bake sale with shortbread cookies. And well, I think maybe they're on to something there. I hope that each of you will explore and follow your curiosities as I have, whether you gain a badge for it or not. All it takes is perseverance, personality, and perhaps a dash of audacity. <laughs> Goodness, look at me like an old soldier telling his war stories. There's much that we haven't discussed yet, and I would love to take your questions now. And when you ask your questions, do tell me your name or perhaps your troop, if you're asking with your troop. Now, I do know that we have some telegram questions that have arrived previously, so I'll start with those. Now, I see we have a Brownie Troop 90673 says, We work very hard on our badges. We heard that if you asked a girl about their badge and they didn't know the answer, you would take it away. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, 
I don't have that policy, and I don't think that I've heard that policy before. You see, it takes quite a bit of skill and training in order to receive a badge, so I doubt that any girl who has put the work into earning her badge is going to forget about all that work and what it means. <laughs> But I'm so glad you could join us today, Brownie Troop 90673. Oh, I see that Heather Robinson asks, if you could see into the future and where we are today, how would you feel about the program? Well, you know, until I have a time machine myself, I certainly can't see into the future, but in a way, I can. Every time I take a look at these young girls and listen to their bright ideas, I am seen into the future. Uh, each of you, young girls, you are the future of Girl Scouts. You are going to determine our path as an organization, and I know that we will continue to grow, we will continue to learn, and we will continue to gain more and more Girl Scouts over the years. I truly do foresee a bright future for our girls. Thank you, Heather. Ah, I see Lizzie from Troop 55262 asks, how did you come up with the activities and how did you get the girls to act as leaders? Oh, Lizzie, that's a wonderful question. Well, you know, many of the activities that we do were based on the Boy Scouts activities, but there are plenty that we've added of our own, of course, I encourage my girls to consider various careers, for instance. Why, I have even encouraged our girls to look into aeronautics, such as piloting an airplane. And I've also encouraged them to become doctors, translators, nurses, teachers, of course. And truly, whatever career they want to pursue, I want our girls to know that they are prepared because of Girl Scouts. So how do I teach them how to act as leaders? Well, to be a Girl Scout is to be a leader, isn't it? All of us are leaders in some sense. We're a leader in our community. We're a leader in our family. We're a leader among our friends. And so the community service that we provide as Girl Scouts, I think is a wonderful way to show leadership to our girls. I also love when all of us girls can get together at the various camps that we have. There is a Camp Lowlands, a bit of a play on words there. And I love to meet all of the new girls I haven't met at Camp Lowlands and come together. And we learn marches and drills. We learn how to be responsible and to do our duties at the camp. So I think that all of these factors are how we treat our girls and, uh, excuse me, how we teach our girls to be great leaders. Thank you, Lizzie. Ah, I see Troop 392 asks, is it true you are blind? Oh goodness, if so, what caused your so loss of sight? And I know, no, my dears, I am not blind, but I am very hard of hearing. Now, some of you may call me deaf, but I do not call myself deaf. There are days when I can hear much better, and strange as it is, it depends on the climate. I, I had mentioned to you before that when I was visiting in Egypt, I could hear so much better than I could back at home in Savannah, and even at Wellsburn House in Scotland and our home in England. I don't know the science behind it, but I did certainly enjoy not having to say, what, excuse me, every single time someone said something back in Egypt. <laughs> now, thank you, Troop 392. I'm so glad you could join us today. And now I see uh, Elena from Troop 532 asks, what was it like living in your time for young women that worked? Well, you know, Elena, I did get to see the working women in Scotland, and it was very hard on them. Young women aren't paid very much in the work that they can find these days, but I would say that things truly are changing. Why, it was only two years ago in 1920 that women were granted the right to vote in the United States. And there's all sorts of new technologies coming about, like the biplane and even silent, uh, what are they called, movies. <laughs> That's right. So there are all sorts of changes, and I do think that 
With our girls, our Girl Scouts are going to find new careers, but many women, they might work in the home. Uh, many women might work as uh, teachers, uh, translators on occasion. Uh, they might be uh, house cleaners. But I do think that there are so many more avenues for women to explore, and I hope that our girls will do just that. Now, our last telegram question is from Rachel from uh, Montana. Uh, Rachel asks, why did you decide to start the Girl Scouts and did you have support from your family? Well, thank you, Rachel. Now, I, of course, I started the Girl Scouts because I was looking for some way to make myself useful to this world. I was already in my 50s and I had not quite found my purpose, so to speak. But once I had met with BP, Sir Robert Baden Powell, and he told me about the Boy Scouts and the Girl Guides, well, it just felt right. And <laughs> I can say that that feeling has lasted. Now, did I have support from my family? Uh, my mother and father were a, a little bit skeptical at first, and it's no wonder. For so much of my life, I had gone from one fascination to another, from painting to sculpture to music, and I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And so when I found girl guiding, my family thought perhaps this was just another one of my crazy daisy fascinations. <laughs> but once they saw how dedicated I was in the good work that we were doing, I had their full support. I only regret that my mother and father are not here to this day to see how much we have grown, but my siblings have been very supportive. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, now, Miss Marie, uh, if you could please tell us what questions do we have that I can answer from our visitors here today? Hello, so we have some uh, questions that our visitors have asked. Jacqueline Arago would like to know how you became the leader of the Girl Scouts. Ah, now how did I become the founder of the Girl Scouts? Well, that all has to do with my friendship with Sir Robert Baden Powell. Now I told you that we were quick friends and I have, I have much to thank for him. Uh, he saw my abilities and he saw that I was ambitious and that I wanted to do some good in this world. And so that was truly how it all began, was the encouragement from a friend. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that question. Piper from Troop 288 would like to know what your favorite outdoor activity is. Oh, Piper, thank you so much for that question. You know, when I think about my favorite activities that we've done, I think about the days that we've gone to the camps. And when we go to our camps, such as uh, Camp Lowlands, oftentimes we would go on wonderful nature walks. Now these nature walks, we would go out into the woods and sometimes we would even have a professional naturalist. That is a scientist who studies nature. And this naturalist was named Walter Hoxie, and he was uh, such a wonderful man, and he still is giving nature walks to this day as I stand here in 1922. And so I think that my nature walks with the young girls would be my favorite. We would go out and try to spot anything that we could name, such as the various uh, trees that we would find, the different species of plant and animal. alongside me, they, of course, have to show that we are trustworthy, that we are organized, and that we have the best interest in mind for those young girls. So while I do regret that some girls were not allowed to join Girl Scouts, so many were. And I think over the years, now that it's been 10 years since we began, quite a lot has changed. And I think that we have also proven ourselves to many of those who might be skeptical of our uh, controversial activities, so to speak. <laughs> I thank you for that question. Bailey from Troop 4031 wants to know what your favorite badge to earn is. 
Oh, Bailey, thank you so very much for that question. Now, there are many badges, of course, that we earn through skills that we learn, but I have to say that the thanks badge is my favorite, and the reason is is that this is a very special badge. The thanks badge may be given to anyone to whom a scout owes gratitude for perhaps uh, assistance in learning something or perhaps in uh, promoting scouting. So every Girl Scout anywhere in the whole world, when she sees the thanks badge, she can recognize that that person who's wearing it is a friend to Girl Scouts. And keep in mind, it is her duty to salute and ask if she can be of any service to the wearer of the thanks badge. So perhaps all of you Girl Scouts out there, if there's someone special in your life that you want to thank, consider making them a thanks badge. That's a wonderful question. Thank you so much. Ava from Troop 22137 wants to know, did rice get thrown in your ears? Oh, Ava, now that was surely an accident. I don't think anyone was out to get me that day as it was our wedding day. And <laughs> But when the rice was being thrown, it is true that I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that one little grain of rice decided the best place to be was in my ear. And it's amazing how something so small can change your life forever. But I also see my hearing loss as a challenge to overcome. And you know, there are Girl Scouts that also have their own challenges that they need to overcome. So I do share that with my girls and how we need to move forward through those challenges and not get down about them. So even though I'm perhaps Still a, a little resentful of that grain of rice. Uh, I've forgiven it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question. One of our guests would like to know, what was the first Girl Scout cookie? Oh, now you mentioned Girl Scout cookies. This is a very new idea. And I did mention that there was a troop in Oklahoma that decided to have a bake sale. And this was a very good fundraiser for them. Now. As I stand here today, well, I have been funding the Girl Scouts for quite some time, but we have found other ways to raise funds. And a bake sale, I think that's a very clever idea. In fact, the most popular cookie that we have for our bake sales that are just beginning now is the shortbread cookie. A very simple cookie to make, and perhaps you could make it yourself and see what you think. It's a very delicious little treat, not too sweet and goes well with tea. So I do hope that you will enjoy that and perhaps host a bake sale of your own. <laughs> Layla from Troop 387 wants to know, how did you feel when you got promoted to founder of the Girl Scouts? Ah, well, it's interesting that you say a, a promotion. <laughs> For me, it, it was a bit sad in a way. Uh, you see, I had been the uh, the president of the Girl Scouts for so long, and so much was within my control. But as we grew and grew and grew to over 80,000 Girl Scouts, well, I needed help with the organization. And I learned the difficult lesson that sometimes, even if it's something we have created on our own, we need to let go of it and let it grow on its own as well. And the women that I have surrounded myself with have just been extraordinary. And in fact, some of them I'd like to uh, call by name. And Helen Storrow, she was one of our early uh, administrators, uh, our executive secretary. And she was the one, the brave soul, who was able to write that letter for me telling me that it was time for me to step down as president and transition to founder. And I do believe that this was the best decision. I have many skills, of course, and I'm a very creative person, a visionary, you could say, but when it comes down to the little things, the organization part, the administrative part, 
Well, I'm not very good at keeping records, so I'm very, very thankful that people like uh, Helen and Edith Johnston, our other executive secretary, and Jane Rippon, our new national director, well, they've all stepped up, and they have made this organization as, uh, as good as it can be, in my opinion, and that was without me. And I, I guide them, of course, and they ask for my advice, and like I said, I do keep a watchful eye on things, and I go all around the country still recruiting for the Girl Scouts, but I have placed my trust in those women, and for them I'm, I'm very, very thankful for them. Thank you for that question. All right, it looks like that is all of the questions that we have today. It looks like we might be experiencing some technical difficulties over on Facebook, but if we have any technical difficulties here, um, we always have these lives recorded so that you can go back and watch them in their full fullness, um, either on our YouTube or our Facebook page at the Northeast Georgia History Center. Well, thank you all for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to meet with you. and. I would like to conclude by having you join me in the Girl Scout Promise. Uh, would you all please join me in standing and, of course, using the Girl Scout salute. On my honor, I will try to do my duty to God and my country, to help other people at all times, and to obey the Scout laws. Now, Goodbye for now, my dears. Uh, I can't wait to see what bright future you have created for yourselves and your community. But for now, I am off to my next recruitment meeting. <laughs> Ta-ta, everyone.